What's up everybody, how's it going? At this point, we've all heard of ChatGPT, the large language model artificial intelligence chatbot recently released by OpenAI. Tons of people have made content about it. I posted two videos recently, one where I had ChatGPT go through a Google coding interview and it aced it, one where I showed a bunch of insane applications of ChatGPT, absolutely mind-blowing, magical stuff. And so the big question that we software engineers have all been asking ourselves is, will ChatGPT replace us? Is ChatGPT so good that it can do our jobs better than we can? Will we never have to go to my company, algoexpert.io, and use the promo code CLEM, CLEM, for a discount on the platform again to prepare for technical interviews because there will be no jobs for us in the first place because ChatGPT will steal them? Well, in this video, I'm going to attempt to answer this question. First, I want to show you six different applications of ChatGPT in the context of programming and software engineering, and then give you my analysis based on these applications and some of the stuff I've seen elsewhere. So with that, here I've got six tabs open. I've pre-talked to ChatGPT, and I want to show you different flavors of how it attempts to do programming problems and how it can potentially replace us. So the first few are just things where I have ChatGPT literally write code from scratch. So the first one is pretty simple. I tell it using Express.js, which is a JavaScript library, create basic API endpoints for a Twitter app. And as you can see, it does just that. It gives me great, seemingly correct boilerplate code for a Twitter CRUD API using Express.js, which is pretty mind-boggling. And it's also mind-boggling that I'm no longer that impressed by this, but it is mind-boggling. Now, the second thing that I had to do is, in the latest version of React, write a common component for a button, like a button that you can press, a common component in React that you can then, you know, extend and, you know, add a bunch of different parameters that you can use in your app. And unsurprisingly by now, it does just that. It creates what looks like a pretty good basic common component for a button. So then I had to do something a little bit more complicated in my eyes, which is to write backend code to handle subscription-based payments with Stripe. Stripe is a very popular payment processor. We use it on Algo Expert. Now, interestingly, it chose to write its code in PHP. Not sure why. <clears throat> Sorry, I had a little bit of vomit in my throat there, but it chose to write it in PHP. Now, I have no idea if this code is actually correct because for one, I've never written in PHP, and for two, I'm not super familiar with the Stripe API and documentation. I'm not the one who wrote that part of the code base on Algo Expert, it was my co-founder Antoine, but it looks seemingly correct. It gives you step-by-step, -step, you know, explanations of what the code does and everything, and yeah, it's pretty incredible boilerplate code. And as you're about to see, you can then push ChatGPT to continue writing more code to code that it's already given you. So that's what I attempted to do in the fourth example. I wanted to really see, can it give me more than just boilerplate? Like, can it give me code that I could copy paste in a real app and have, you know, work? So what I did is, I took some legitimately existing code in an existing use case in the Algo Expert website on the front end, and I asked ChatGPT to do something with it, or to recreate it rather. So I gave it two TypeScript interfaces. Here are the interfaces. And these are just like types, right? Just structures of an entity in the code for an offering or like a product, and specifically discounts on a product. So, you know, on Algo Expert, we can have discounts on products. Like, you know, if you use a promo code, like a promo code CLEM, CLEM, or if you have a bundle of multiple products. And so this is what the interface looks like. And I asked it to write a block of React code that shows or displays these discounts on, you know, various rows. And that's something that we actually have on the purchase page of Algo Expert. And I gave it a few pointers, like what classes to put and everything, you know, wh where to put like the the um, the discount names and then the discount like amounts within span tags and things like that. But I wasn't sure if it was going to really be able to replicate what we have on Algo Expert. And to my surprise, it was able to do that. So here, it gave me a block of React code, 
not the most idiomatic React code. Like it uses this weird react.clone element to add a, a class of margin bottom to the last row. But still, like, it was able to do what I asked it to do. And it's, you know, the code is like very close to identical to what we have on Algo Expert, at least like the inner code here. You know, you've got divs, they've got a class name row. You have to put a key because you're iterating through multiple things in React. You have two spans. You know, it, it was even like it figured out that it should round the amount of the discount to two decimals, which makes sense for like dollar amounts. Um, and so this is like pretty incredible. So then I wanted to see, can I continue going with this, right? If I, if I push it further on the same application. So I said, okay, uh, what if this component also takes an offering property? Because right now it only had it take discounts, which is like this structure here of discounts. But I said, what if it also takes um, an offering property that has three properties itself? A name, a base price, and a final price. And I want the name of the offering as well as its base price to be shown above the discounts and then the final price below the discounts. And again, it was able to do that. You know, it, it took the same code and it added these things. Like here you see it added a row and it even knew, like I don't think I told it. Yeah, I didn't tell it that the offering and the base price and final prices needed to be in divs with the class name row but it knew, it kind of like figured out to do that. You see, like here, it added a row with the offering name and the offering base price, again, rounded to do decimals. Then it put the discount elements. And then it put um, another row with the total and the, you know, the, the rounded final price. And it kind of kept that same structure with um, a span around the name of the offering and around the total, and then, you know, a span around the prices. And I didn't even say, yeah, I didn't even say to write the word total. Like it knew, it knew to write the word total, which is ironically exactly what we have on Algo Expert. Like that's, that's pretty incredible. You see, like when I started seeing this, like I, I became more and more a believer that this can go beyond just, you know, boilerplate code. Like the two first examples, Still super impressive, but just boilerplate. Here, it's actually like progressively developing a feature for me. Now, I took this to the next level with the next application by again giving it existing code in Algo Expert, except here I literally just copy pasted an entire component that we have on Algo Expert for something called a product badge. It's in the little user drop down menu on the website. I'll put a picture here so that you can see what we're talking about. And I wanted to see like, if I have it just edit that component, can it do it for me? So I was like, hey, you know, there's a, there are properties in React, you know, you pass in like props, like parameters to a component. We already have the property route, but can you make that optional? And then add a class to the rendered link, which is a component, you can see it right here. Here, we've got a link here. Add a class that uh, to that component where if the route parameter is undefined, there should be the class product badge unclickable. Okay, let's see if it can do that. And of course it could. It gave me the new properties with the optional route. That's this question mark here. And then here you see it added, if the route is undefined uh, or if the route is defined, you just don't add a class, you add an empty string. Otherwise you add product unclickable, which is really like nice. Like it was able to take the code and kind of like find where it had to be placed. Also, interestingly, when I first, you know, was playing with this before the video, I thought that it had a bug because here it didn't put a space between these two class names and you need spaces between class names and, and HTML and CSS, but it actually did. Like here, this is the string for the, for the class and it put the space in the string. So if you're a front end engineer, you probably understand what's going on here. But anyway, so then I continued. It gets more impressive. I continued and I said, can you also add a div below the tooltip if owns product, which was a property, is true that says that the product is owned and using the user-friendly product name as the name of the product. That's a variable that's in the code here. We declare user-friendly product name here. And again, lo and behold, it was able to do that. It gave me the full code. I think I told it 
Uh, no, I didn't even say to give me the full code, but it regave me the full code. This is identical code to what I copy pasted, except now it has this new optional route with the unclickable thing, right? And it has in this ternary here that only gets rendered when owns product is true. It has a new div that says user-friendly product name is owned. And it even put a class that kind of makes sense, product badge owned which is really cool because like I didn't tell it. Yeah, I didn't tell it to put that to put that class name. And it put it because it just kind of makes sense here. You probably would want something like that. Although to be honest, perhaps you wouldn't want a product badge here. You would probably want like description text or something, but still, still very incredible. Now then I continued and I said, okay, we also need the text C details inside that div at the end of the text that calls an API when it's clicked. I gave the API endpoint and I said it should pass in product as a parameter. Can you give me the full code with that added? And again, it immediately did. Product is already passed to the component and it added a click handler, handle click, that uses fetch, the native fetch in JavaScript, and it calls that API endpoint, passes the product as a parameter, and then you know it even adds a comment to where you can do something with the data. And then it added it here, you see C details. One thing it did that I didn't want it to do, it put the on click handler on the full div rather than just on C details. Like I would have preferred, you know, to have this be in a span or something, which I didn't mention to be fair. But so yeah, here it did one thing that I didn't necessarily like exactly want, but I could easily have it fix it now. So, so far, like I am mind blown, like it's actually doing kind of my job for me, although I'm telling it what to do, right? I have to give a lot of details, but still. And then finally, perhaps the most insane thing uh, is that I then tell it, okay, great. Can you transcribe all this code to the latest version of Angular, still using TypeScript, because here we're using React, and boom, it does it. And Angular, mind you, is like very different from React, very different, and it does it. Like it writes the, the um, JavaScript, and then it also writes the like template because in Angular, you have like a separate HTML file. I don't know if this is 100% correct because I don't write in Angular these days. Uh, it looks kind of correct. You know, I remember things like ngif and content and all that. It looks kind of correct. Uh, I'm going to assume it is, but it's still pretty insane that it like get, gets me something that is almost certainly correct like this. Okay, so at this point, like, Hopefully you're as kind of mind blown as me that it can actually go beyond just giving you starter code or whatever. It can actually create real code and, and edit existing code. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to test more complicated things because of the way that ChatGPT is laid out right now. Like I wasn't able to give it like three different files, you know, I had to give it, uh, you know, only like one file. But it would have been really interesting to see, like, if I give it, you know, four different files, can it create a feature that is going to have to work or make edits to multiple files? And this is where I think it'll be really interesting once ChatGPT gets more productionized and we get to see that more, you know, we get to do these kinds of things. Now, the final application that I need to sh show you is I gave it a debugging task. I copied the quick sort algorithm that we have on Algo Expert. I put one little bug in it here, right here on this line. This lesser than sign should be lesser than or equal. That's the bug. And without the or equal, this code just breaks it like it's like an infinite loop or something. And I said, can you, you know, there's a bug in this quick sort algorithm. What is the bug? And it gave me like, a seemingly confident answer. But when I copied this code and even tells me like where the bug was, you know, like, oh, you have to place the, the pivot element in the correct position, blah, 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 with comments. But when I copy pasted the code, like it didn't work. It didn't fix the bug. And so I told it that didn't work. Can you try again? It gave me something else. And again, it didn't work. So again, here, it wasn't able to catch the bug. Now, interestingly, I ran the same prompt on another tab, like just a completely different thread. And that time it did find the bug, which was kind of like mind boggling, like it did find it. And then I ran it again a third time and it was back to this answer, like 
kind of like this one where it just didn't find it. So maybe 50-50, but clearly there are times where like it cannot find the bug. And I can only imagine that for much more complicated bugs that involve, you know, multiple files or involve, you know, a database and a backend or a UI and a backend or network issues or things like that, it will just, you know, poop out and it will not know how to solve these bugs or debug them. And so this brings me to my analysis of is ChatGPT a genuine threat to software engineers? Will it realistically replace us anytime soon or even in the medium term future? And my answer, despite all these applications here that I've shown you that are pretty insane, is no, absolutely not. And I'm going to give you four very succinct reasons for which I don't think it's the case. Number one, as you've seen, all the outputs that ChatGPT gives us are outputs that only software engineers can really grok or do anything with. Back when I had never written a line of code in my life, like six years ago, if I had you know, these outputs, like, oh, a common component for a button or whatever, or, oh, a Stripe, you know, backend code, I wouldn't even know what to do with them. Like, great, it gave me code. I have no idea what to do with it. I don't know where to stick it. I don't know where to host it. I don't know what to do, you know? So that's the number one thing is that unlike something like autonomous vehicles, where the end product is kind of like the driving and anybody can understand the driving or anybody can be driven around, here, the end product right now is just the code, and the only people who can manipulate that code or use it are software engineers. So right then and there, I think it just it doesn't replace us, it helps us. But now what if you say, okay, well, Clement, you just need to productionize it, right? You just need to get to a point where you have a UI and you press a button and it creates the website for you. And it gives it to someone who's never written code in their life and they just have the website, you know, or the app. But the thing is, that brings us to the second point, which is that, as we saw earlier, there are a lot of times where we just kind of have to blindly trust ChatGPT. Like, I've never written PHP. I've re never, you know, worked with Stripe directly. So I don't know if the code is correct or not. And it's very possible that it made a mistake, you know, or that it left, you know, a security loophole or something. And we've seen, you know, other people who've made videos and tweets and everything about ChatGPT where there are incorrect answers, incorrect code, incorrect whatever. And no business is going to take the risk, especially the greater the app and the more, you know, complex it is, the more users it has, blah, blah. No business is going to take the risk to deploy code or ship code that, you know, just has to blindly trust is correct. And who's going to be able to determine if it's correct? Software engineers. So you need software engineers. Now, the third point is that when there are inevitable bugs, as you can see with the Quicksort example, it doesn't always know how to debug them or how to solve those bugs. And so when there is an inevitable bug, that bug can be catastrophic. You know, one bug can bring an entire application or website completely down. And so what is a business gonna do in that case? They're not just gonna have a couple of like contractor software engineers on call to debug random bugs from code that they haven't written, that they have no context about. No, that's not how it works. And so I don't think that ChatGPT once again will replace software engineers. It's just, it doesn't work that way. That's not how software works. It's far too risky. The fourth and final reason for which I don't think it will replace software engineers is that as you saw with the last couple of examples or the ones with the components where I was kind of doing a back and forth with ChatGPT, you start to realize that there's an art to the prompt writing process, right? You have to feed it certain prompts where you give it certain explanations that it can use to spit out code. And that prompt writing is difficult in and of itself. And it requires a lot of handholding and a lot of details that are low key tedious to write. Like when you, if you have to give it a bunch of different instructions, like if this happens, do that. If that happens, do this, blah, blah, blah. And you can imagine that this becomes increasingly required as your app becomes more and more complex. Like Facebook that has like billions of different features, you can't just tell ChatGPT like, oh yeah, create, you know, Facebook groups and messages and create Facebook uh, advertising suite. Like, no, you have to give it 
detailed instructions and parameters of every single feature, right, to the T. And that becomes like a job in and of itself that is intrinsically technical. And it actually kind of reminds me of all of those no-code tools, things like Webflow, Wix, Squarespace. I don't know if you've ever used them. I actually used Webflow very recently for something. They're surprisingly difficult. Like, yes, they might be easier than just writing code for someone who's never written code in their lives, but there's still a big learning curve. Like as a software engineer, I find them difficult to use. I prefer just writing code. And so that leads me to believe that like chat GPT is not just going to be something that suddenly like, you know, obsoletes every software engineer. No, if anything, it might create like these new agencies that create websites with chat GPT and give, you know, no coders some tools and abilities to create, you know, technical things with chat GPT, but it's still not going to be the same thing as just real coding. It's just not. And so my conclusion is that ChatGPT will not at all replace software engineers, but instead it will be a huge quality of life improvement for software engineers. It will help them perform certain tasks much better. For example, you need to migrate a code base from one language to another or from one framework to another. Back when I was at Google, we had to do that. We had to go from like Angular 1 or 1.5 to Angular 2, and that was a huge effort. That, I think ChatGPT might be able to help us do much faster or, you know, create boilerplate code or, you know, starter code or assist us with things to make us faster at our jobs. Absolutely. But is it going to replace us? I just don't see it right now. Let me know what you think in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to smash the like button, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Follow me on LinkedIn and Twitter if you enjoy short form written content, Instagram if you like pictures, and I will see you in the next video.